Okay, uh, we're getting started here, and uh, it's so good to see everyone uh, this morning. Uh, I do not look like uh, your normal teacher here. Uh, Brian Gentle is not with us today, and he made provisions and got Clip Knapp to teach this class. And Clip Knapp got sick. So I'm a sub for a sub this morning. And um, I found this out uh, uh, very recently. And so uh, I thought, what should I do here to uh, kind of tie in and yet not steal thunder from the class on Genesis? And so uh, I'm going to pick up here with... Uh, some verses that are not too far ahead of, of where we've gotten to and, and go into a little detail on that and, and maybe go in a direction that he wouldn't have. Um, now let's begin with a prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for all that you give us, for waking us up this morning and giving us a sleep in the night. We uh, thank you for uh, being able to be here. Thank you, Father, for those who are with us online, and we pray that you would bless each one. Father, there are many uh, in our midst with uh, special needs, physical needs, spiritual needs, uh, and, and, and others that, that uh, only you know and only you can, can meet. And Father, we pray that you would bless each one. Help us to serve you. Help us uh, in this class period to uh, study your truth and only your truth about the subject at hand and, and uh, uh, to learn something that will, will help us uh, be more what you would have us to be. Forgive us of our sins. Bless us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, I'm skipping just a little bit to Genesis 18. And... Um, in the first five verses it says, Now the Lord appeared to him, that is to Abram, uh, by the oaks of Mamre, while he was sitting at the uh, tent door of the uh, heat of the day, when he lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, three men were standing opposite him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and bowed himself to the earth and said, My Lord, if, I, if now I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass your servant by Please let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will bring a piece of bread and you may refresh yourselves. After that, you may go on since you have visited your servant. And they said, so do as you have said. Well, who are these men? Um, one of them is identified from verse 13 of, of uh, chapter 18, uh, near the end of the chapter, is, and from there to the end of the chapter, is repeatedly called the Lord. Now, the Lord here is a Hebrew uh, name of, personal name of God, sometimes represented by the English letters Y-H-V-H, and somewhat erroneously uh, translated as Jehovah. We have no true idea of how that name was pronounced. But how could the Lord uh, come to earth in physical form? Well, some have suggested that this man, this physical form of Jehovah, was um, actually a, an Old Testament example of Jesus. Jesus came to earth uh, God in fleshly body, and I couldn't prove or disprove that. Others say that uh, it was an angel uh, speaking on behalf of the Lord, and certainly there are examples of, of that uh, in the Old Testament, and even later here in Genesis, uh, where uh, something that an angel would say or do is attributed directly to the Lord. Um, but at least two of these seem to have been angels. And so to tie into uh, Brian's 
study on Genesis, I'm going to look at these two men and, and look at what are angels. Um, and so we're going to look at angels in the Bible. Um, that's a very popular subject uh, today is, is angels. And um, there's an awful lot of misunderstanding about them. Well, when we think of heaven, there, there are different heavenly beings up there. And I don't know that we know all, because not all are necessarily uh, uh, explained to us in the Bible. But in heaven, of course, we have God. God is, is uh, supreme. He's over all. He's the source of all light and all goodness. Uh, he's the creator of all. He's a spirit, a spiritual being, John 4, 24, Jesus tells us. And, so, and he's pure. He's holy. He's without sin. He's without physical limit. Then we have a, two other kinds of beings described to us that are, how can we say it? Strange, um, very, uh, we might even say weird, hard to understand. And understand this, that the, the description of the cherubim and seraphim may be highly symbolic and may not really reflect a physical reality at all, but spiritual reality. In fact, I tend to, to think in those, those terms because, like God, they're spiritual beings. And, uh, and so the descriptions of them, uh, uh, while they, they are in physical uh, descriptions, uh, may reflect more spiritual uh, realities than, than the actual physical. By the way, the I am, whenever you see that on a, uh, the, the end of an Old Testament word, that means it's plural. One would be a cherub. One would be a seraph. But plural is cherubim and seraphim, like we would add an S. In Hebrew, they added im to it to make it plural. Uh, or like we might add in on children uh, to make it plural. Very, very old uh, English plural. Um, so these are majestic, the cherubim are majestic winged creatures of heaven. In Genesis 3, 24, we see them as being placed to guard the entrance to Eden uh, after the sin of Adam and Eve. Otherwise, the Bible associates them with the throne of God. So we see in Psalm uh, 99.1 and uh, 1 Samuel 4.4, 4, uh, they, were, they were depicted by uh, solid gold statues uh, that sat on the lid of the ark, or the mercy seat it was called, of the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was... Uh, roughly the size of this communion table, and it had a solid gold lid, and these cherubim, which are depicted as having wings that touched uh, there in the middle. And so, um, uh, but they were symbolically guarding because that was representative of the throne of God, and they were symbolically guarding uh, his throne. Uh, likewise, um, and uh, throughout the tabernacle and the temple, there were wood carvings, either of, of olive wood or of cedar, and these were covered uh, with uh, or plated with gold. And um, again, they're depicted as, as having wings. Um, they are uh, described in uh, Ezekiel chapter 1, and I'm not going to read the whole uh, chapter and they're just called living beings in Ezekiel chapter 1. But in, in uh, chapter 10 and verse 20, he goes back and identifies those as cherubim. And uh, uh, they're described as each one having the face of a man, the face of a lion, the face of a bull, and the face of an eagle. And feet like the hooves of a calf. Um, very strange creatures that we see. Um, 
And uh, in Ezekiel 41, 18 through 25, the carvings in the temple uh, had two faces, uh, that of a man and that of a lion, looking opposite directions. And the seraphim uh, are uh, described in Isaiah 6, 2, and also in, in Revelation 4 uh, as uh, having uh, six wings. With two, they covered their face. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they fly. And they're full of eyes all over. The wings, the bodies, every, they're, they're full of eyes uh, and everywhere, and they, they fly and worship God, saying, holy, holy, holy. In both the Old Testament uh, visions of heaven and in Revelation, again, these descriptions are doubtless highly figurative. We need not think of them as, as literal uh, because we're describing spiritual things, and um, we don't know exactly how to take those except that, God was trying to give a spiritual lesson about his nature and the nature of his creatures. Um, angels. Angels, on the other hand, <clears throat> um, are, shall we say, more common, more numerous, uh, occasionally seen by humans. And so we have sometimes literal descriptions of how they appeared at that point. So the question is, how did they appear? And again, we must keep in mind that they're spiritual beings, and the form they take when they appear to men may not necessarily be the form that they take when, um, when they're in heaven. It may not reflect a permanent fixed uh, spiritual form because, again, they are spirit. Um, now, <clears throat> sometimes they are unseen. The, um, um, for example, in um, um, Genesis 22 and 15, which again Brian will get to, says the angel of the Lord spoke to Abraham, called out to Abraham as he's about to kill Isaac on that altar. It doesn't say he appeared at all. He just heard the angel of the Lord. Uh, <laughs> sometimes it's only, an angel's only partially seen like uh, when uh, Balaam is going along the road and he doesn't see the angel that's about to kill him and down the road, but the donkey is riding on does, and, and he has this conversation with the donkey to uh, set him straight. And so sometimes we don't see in the Bible that, that the angel may not be seen at all. Sometimes the angel may appear in a totally non-human form. For example... We read in Exodus 3, 2, the angel of the Lord appeared to him, that is to Moses, in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. The angel appeared as a fire in this bush. No human form at all. No arms, legs, anything like that. Just fire. And spoke to Moses at that point. Um, sometimes they're seen uh, in a human form, but, but uh, described as being uh, like lightning and, and shining, gleaming. Uh, we see this in the New Testament in um, Matthew 28, 3. Uh, it's described as having the appearance of lightning. Uh, with clothes white as snow, the same angel in Mark 16, 5, apparently as, as a young man in a white robe. And in Luke 24, 2, there are two described at that same situation, all these at the, the tomb of the risen Lord, and uh, the, described as, as uh, uh, two men in gleaming clothing. And I think of this as uh, similar to how Jesus appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration uh, when uh, he became very bright, his face is the sun, his clothes white as the light, 
in Matthew 17 and 3. But mostly angels appeared as ordinary men and were frequently simply mistaken for men. Judges 13, an angel appears to Manoah, who had become the father of uh, Samson. And uh, it says uh, specifically in verse 16 of, of um, Judges 13, it says, Manoah did not know that he was an angel of the Lord. And he'd been talking to him. And he invites him to lunch. And the angel says, I won't eat your food. But you can sacrifice it to the Lord. And, and Manoah does. And he doesn't really realize this is an angel until the angel miraculously uh, ascends into heaven there um, with that sacrifice. And so then, of course, Manoah's frightened that uh, uh, after the fact. But he didn't know it. That's my point, that it looked like a man nobody would have noticed. Uh, Manoah certainly didn't notice it. It wasn't in our passage that we began with in, in 18.2. It says, uh, Genesis 18.2, it says, Abraham saw three men opposite him. And when I told how Abraham eventually discovered this as God among them, um, maybe he figured it out from similar to similarity to other appearances that he'd had. But um, we don't, we're not told when he, in this encounter, he realized that, that one of these uh, is God. But um, uh, he offered the hospitality as one of that culture would do to any passing stranger. And uh, Hebrews 13, 2 apparently uh, alludes to this when it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Uh, so apparently Abraham here did not know it. When the two angels go on down to, to Sodom, neither Lot nor the men of Sodom recognize them as angels. Um, <laughs> certainly, <clears throat> if... You know, if, if, if you or I were one of those men of Sodom, I don't think they'd have acted the way they did if they had realized that these two are not ordinary men. These two are, in fact, supernatural emissaries from God. They wouldn't have to have had a lot of theology to have been frightened to, to even approach them, much less try to sin against them. And so um, clearly... Uh, they just appeared as men. I think of this, of this, you know, when, when Lot's in-laws rejected the message, come, we, we've got to get, the Sodom's about to be destroyed, and they think, ah, they're joking. If these men had been obviously angels, they'd have, they'd have said, okay, we're out of here, if that's their message. And I think today, how people fail to recognize God's messenger, fail to recognize God's word as from God, and so they laugh at it, don't take it seriously. Uh, nor sometimes do they take us seriously when we are trying to tell them what God's messenger has said. Acts 6.15, there's a passage that talks about uh, Stephen. He's standing before the Sanhedrin. He's been charged with serious crimes. And he's about to speak to them. And after which they're about to stone him to death. But <clears throat> as he begins his message, it says, And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. What did that mean? Was it bright and shining like Moses' face when he came away from uh, being with God on, on the mount or from going into the temple and being with God? And he had to put a, uh, a veil over his face so that 
the people would not be so frightened of him? I hardly think so. Why? Like those people, the people of Israel, Moses had to put that veil on there because that bright shining face frightened them. Can you imagine the people of the Sanhedrin who are Bible-believing Jews, even though they don't believe fully and they don't believe all of God's truth, they believe basically in God. Most of them, not all of them, uh, believe in, in angels. And if what is meant there is that his face was shining bright like, like the sun, I don't think they'd have condemned him to death and rushed out and stoned him. They'd have said, what you say, we believe, we follow. So that's not what it means. So what does it mean when it says face like an angel? And remember, most of the times angels appeared, people didn't know they were angels. They thought they were just men. I suspect Luke is telling us that his face was firm, resolute, showing faith rather than fear, confidence rather than quivering. He faced them with the, with the determination and confidence in God that an angel would have. Not some miraculous sign. By the way, one of the things that I mentioned with the seraphim and the, and the, the cherubim, and you'll notice I haven't mentioned with angels, despite all the pictures, all the statues, all the, the little images hanging from the uh, hanging from the car windows. Nowhere in the Bible is any angel ever described as having wings or a halo. No wings, no halos. Um, this idea comes to us from the ancient pagan culture where anything associated with the gods was likely to be portrayed as having wings. Thus, in ancient uh, Greece, we see the flying horse, Pegasus. Less well known as the flying pig, uh, which actually, I didn't make that up. There are ancient images of pigs with wings because they belong to the gods, and therefore they must have had wings. Uh, so why do we picture them? Well, again, we pick that up from ancient pagan art. I don't know how well you can see that. Uh, it's the best picture I could get. Um, that is a picture of an angel on a coin. No, it's not. That is a coin from ancient Pergamum uh, from 200 B.C. roughly, and what's pictured on there is the pagan god Nike, or we might say Nike, the god of victory. Very much a pagan god, and that's where we get our image of angels with wings. Do they not bring us victory? So let's just put, them, put wings on them. Uh, even though in the Bible there are no images of of uh, descriptions of angels with wings or halos. And um, there's no hint of uh, any, any of that. And um, for that matter, you'll understand there's no Jewish or Hebrew de uh, artistic depiction of an angel or of God or of any man or anything because of the the command, you'll have no graven images. So they didn't make them. And maybe that's a good point for us. Maybe we shouldn't try to have images of angels. Another thing about a uh, little misconception, there's no hint anywhere in Scripture that a Christian or a baby or anyone else becomes an angel when they die. Sorry, Clarence. No wings, no promotion, no matter how many bells ring. 
If you don't get that allusion to the movie, I don't know what country you grew up in. Uh, <laughs> now, in some ways, when we die, we become like angels. Jesus said there's, there's no giving uh, uh, in marriage or marrying uh, after death. Uh, we are like the angels who, again, they're not physical. They don't have physical needs of reproduction. And so uh, they are, uh, and, and we will be like that. So there are some ways it will be like the angels. Uh, but uh, we are, uh, we certainly don't become angels, or at least there's no scripture anywhere that hints at that. I don't know where that originated. So, what do angels do? Well, the word in Greek means um, messenger. It's angelos, and uh, it just means messenger. The word itself is frequently used of ordinary men. Uh, James uses it to refer to the 12 spies sent out by Joshua. They were his, his angels, his messengers. Uh, to spy out the land. Um, James 2.25, uh, the, the disciples sent by John the Baptist to Jesus uh, were called his messengers or his angels. Uh, John the Baptist himself was, uh, by prophecy, I will send my messenger. Uh, Luke 7.22 translates that angel. Um, even Paul's thorn in the flesh uh, Paul calls an angel or a messenger sent by Satan uh, to buffet his body, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And even though tradition and, and most translations uh, assume Acts 12, 15 as talking about Peter's angel, it's much more likely that when Peter's in prison and, and the, the, the angel comes and lets him out, and um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the little handmaid Rhoda comes and, and hears him knocking, goes to get, says, ah, it's Peter, and runs back without opening the door, and they don't believe it. Surely it's his, and most versions say angel. Uh, probably that's better translated messenger. They wouldn't have expected him to have an angel. Uh, he didn't expect an angel to open the door. But uh, they would have expected him to be able to send messengers from prison. That was not that unusual. Another function is that angels are often, perhaps always, God's agents in a physical world. We see this in Genesis 19, uh, where they will destroy, they will come and, and, and rescue Lot, and his daughters, and then destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Exodus 33 uh, and uh, 2, um, we, see, um, we see them acting as, as, uh, as God's agent when uh, it says, God says, I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite. Who's going to drive all these nations out before them? God is. How's he going to do it? I will send an angel before you. Um, with the, the, for lack of time, I'll skip some of my examples. Uh, an angel of the Lord uh, was the agent of the pestilence that was a part of, of uh, David's punishment, 1 Samuel 24, 16. 2 Kings 19, 35. In one night, the angel of the Lord killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers who had been laying siege to Jerusalem. Psalm 103, 20 says, Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength, who perform his word. Obeying the voice of his word. They are his agents. Another function is that they, uh, I had that scripture up there. Um, another function, they, they worship. Psalm 148.2 says, praise him, all his angels, praise him, all his hosts. And we share this function with angels that our purpose is to glorify God and to worship him. That's our purpose in creation, uh, to have been, why we're here. 
No, why, what am I doing here? Why am I doing here? I'm here to glorify God. I'm not here to be happy. I'm not here to have fun. I'm not here to get rich. I'm here on this planet to glorify God. And that makes me happy, and that makes me full of joy, and that makes me spiritually rich when I do that. And maybe from, from our standpoint, the most important function of angels uh, is found in <clears throat> Hebrews 1.14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Now, this is not for a new thing, just for Christians. God's angels have always served as ministering spirits. And so uh, we see in uh, Exodus uh, 23, uh, 20, that um, he says, Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place uh, which I have prepared. Uh, Daniel, spending the night in the lion's den, told the king, My God sent his angels and shut the lion's mouth, and they have not harmed me. Um, and that's uh, Daniel six twenty two. And we see in the New Testament, um, Lazarus is said to have been carried to Abraham's bosom by angels. Uh, and the angels ministered to Jesus after the 40-day fast. And um, the end of the temptations there in, in uh, uh, Luke 4. Now we don't, no, and, and, and really shouldn't speculate on the ways angels minister to saints today. We've not been given that information. But we can know they do and have confidence in that. Some believe in individual guardian angels, and the Scriptures don't specifically teach that. Uh, the examples we've given of, of ministering are, are not examples of a single guardian angel assigned to an individual. Um, in fact, Elisha, on one occasion at least, seems to have, when he needed it, a whole army of angels, 2 Kings 6.17, uh, surrounding his city. Uh, the closest statement that, that might indicate an individual guardian angel uh, existed would be Jesus' statement about children in Matthew 18.10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that there are angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Now, it's difficult to know exactly what he was saying other than that God is acutely aware of how we treat children. But he doesn't actually say that each child individually has a guardian angel assigned, but that the guardians care for them, the angels care for them, are watching over them, and appear before God and report. Let's look quickly at some things that angels are not. First of all, they're not all-knowing. They're not omniscient like God. Jesus said they didn't know the, final, the time of the final coming, Matthew 24, 36. Uh, although they wanted to, they didn't know exactly what God was up to all those years of the Old Testament. Through, uh, when, they sent, when God sent them with, with uh, messages and God sent uh, the prophets with messages. But First Peter 1.12, speaking of the Old Testament prophets, prophets, says, it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. And these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Angels didn't fully understand it even, he uses the present tense, even as Peter was writing that. Angels are not above sinning. 2 Peter 2, 4 talks about if, um, if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And he goes on, his point is, hey, if he punished sinning angels, he knows how to punish you if you rebel against him. Um, and um, we don't know. There's a lot of speculation in, in ancient literature as well as modern 
what that refers to, we, but we know that they did. Angels do not have authority to change the gospel in any way or add to it or take from it. But, it. but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed, Paul said in, first, in Galatians, the uh, first chapter, verse 18. Uh, even if an angel reveals a message from God different from or beyond what we have in the Bible, that angel and all those who follow him stand accursed. And there are those today who believe that they have a gospel revealed in modern times by angels. Paul says they are accursed. Angels are not objects of worship. Revelation 19.10, one who was apparently an angel had been speaking to John, and John says, Then I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, Do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours, and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Our worship is to be of God through Christ, not angels. There are a lot of people in the first, second centuries who worshipped angels. They had this hierarchy of angels that they had worked out. Uh, they had them by names. They had the, and they worshipped them as a part of their Christian religion. It wasn't really Christian. It was heresy. And there are those today who worship idols who worship angels. Did I say idols? A few, no, several years ago now, I was in a Christian bookstore in another city, one of our brotherhood bookstores. And there in the checkout counter was a little display, little, little cards with, with little pins of angels with their wings uh, and halos, uh, which angels didn't have. And, you know, designed to, you know, pin on your collar or, or perhaps uh, some other place to put, a, put an angel. And the message on the card said that pin me on your, your collar or whatever it was. Hang, hang me uh, uh, about your neck as a necklace says, to protect you. And to bring you good luck. Folks, if that's why you wear an angel pen, you are an idolater. Let me repeat that. I'm serious about that. If you wear an angel pen or anything else, a cross or whatever, and you think that is going to protect you and bring you luck and blessings, you are guilty of idolatry. God brings the blessings. And yes, he sends his angels, <laughs> but not physical pins and jewelry and things that, that uh, are made by the hands of men. And uh, that's the end of my lesson. And I've been, I've rushed through because my, my wife said, don't let people talk because if you do, you'll never get finished. <laughs> she knows me. And first of all, I want to say, this is not a complete lesson. There are, we could have a quarter on this. Second, let me say, I'm not the expert. So if you've got questions, go to your Bible. I think I've told you everything I know. <laughs> um, if you were here Wednesday night I'm not quite at, at Mount Stupid yet because I know I don't know a lot but I'm not very high up on the other side either so um, um, if, um, if, you, uh, if you have questions I'd be glad to discuss them and talk with you and if you've got a question that now we've got four and a half minutes now yes spiritual warfare 
Yes. And there is spiritual warfare. And two of the camps are angels mm -hmm. and demons. Mm -hmm. we, we know of angels working throughout man's history, but we also know of demons working as well. Neither one possesses us. Mm -hmm. One fights for us, one fights against us. I don't know what point that was. It's just about Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and uh, for those of you at home or maybe even here who couldn't hear that, it brings up that Paul talks uh, actually in several places, but specifically in, in Ephesians about uh, the warfare, the spiritual warfare that we're engaged in, and there are spiritual powers he says, in the heavenly places, which doesn't just mean in, he in heaven. In Ephesians, it, it, that means uh, in, uh, in the spiritual realm. And uh, there are both evil and good spiritual powers vying for our loyalty. You'll notice I didn't mention the evil powers today because I knew I only had 45 minutes. And uh, so I didn't even even try to... Uh, talk about the devil and his angels, or some would say, was the devil an angel uh, who's fallen? Because uh, it says angels sinned, but I don't know that. That is pure speculation. John Milton thought he knew, but the, you know, the rest of us are pretty much uh, left. And, and those are the kinds of speculations that I think Paul warned Timothy about not getting into. And, and old wives' tales and such. So we, we don't need to go places where we don't know. If we've got God's light, we can see where we're going. Let's go there. But if, if, if we don't on a given subject, uh, let's, uh, let's refrain from going that direction. Yes? I may have missed something. Um, when you say there was no hint of angels having wings, do you mean human form with wings? There's no hint of angels... Any angel, now the cherubim and seraphim are, are pictured as having multiple wings, but there's no, there's no picture description of an angel having a wing or a halo. Halos, by the way, come from medieval art. The idea that, that um, uh, holy people, Jesus, uh, Mary, the prophets, uh, and angels were holy, so like Moses, they must, their faces must have shined. And so they pictured them with a glow around their head, which eventually was stylized to an arc around their head uh, and later on became a little circle around their heads. Uh, but that's not biblical. That's medieval and Renaissance art. Well, I believe our time, we've got about... 20 seconds, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it quits there. Thank you.